Chapter 2 Design and Construction Introduction It is important for the aspiring rigger to understand basic design parameters and construction techniques of modern parachute systems. The master rigger must have a thorough understanding of these areas to perform any desired or necessary alterations. An understanding of how the systems or components were originally designed, and why they were constructed as they were is essential. Any proposed alteration may degrade the function and or structural integrity of the assembly or component thereby causing it to fail. Parachute Design and Construction The design parameters for certificated parachutes are set forth in Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, documents, specifically within the Technical Standard Order, TSO, system. Parachute certification standards fall within the TSO C23 series. Currently, there are three TSO documents under which parachutes are manufactured, C23B, C23C, and C23D. Appendix A of this handbook explains these standards in detail. Military parachutes are manufactured and certified under a military drawing system, however, some manufacturers have certified them under the TSO system as well. Advisory Circular, AC, 1052D, Sport Parachuting explains that a parachute assembly normally, but not exclusively, consists of the following major components, a canopy, a deployment device, a pilot chute and inner drogue, risers, a stowage container, a harness, and an actuation device, ripcord. Component parts parachute assemblies and component parts are identified in the following discussion. The appropriate nomenclatures, as well as the commonly accepted names, are defined below. Main parachute canopy The main parachute canopy is used in conjunction with a reserve parachute assembly as the primary parachute canopy for a premeditated jump. The main canopy consists of everything from the main riser connector links to the bridle attachment point, excluding the steering toggles. The major parts are the suspension lines and the canopy. Figure 2 1 Reserve Parachute Canopy The reserve parachute canopy is worn in conjunction with a main parachute used for premeditated jumps. The reserve parachute consists of everything from the reserve riser connector links to the bridle attachment point, excluding the steering toggles. The major parts are the canopy, suspension lines, and any type of deployment device that is sewn to the canopy or lines. Emergency Parachute Canopy The emergency parachute canopy is worn for emergency, unpremeditated use only. The canopy may be identical to the reserve parachute canopy. Harness slash container The harness and container assembly includes all the remaining parts necessary to complete an airworthy parachute system except for the canopies. The basic harness slash container assembly is what remains when all items that can be removed without unstitching have been removed. Most sport parachute assemblies have the harness and containers integrated into one assembly, but many military assemblies may be disassembled into separate harness and container subassemblies. The following items are subcomponents of the harness slash container assembly and are shown in figure 2-2. Pilot chutes and bridles for the main and reserve parachutes The pilot chute is a small parachute or similar device that enters the airstream when released to act as a drag device and withdraw the canopy from the container. As such, it maintains tension on the canopy and lines during the deployment process, except for reserve-free bags. Pilot chutes are either spring-loaded or manually thrown into the airstream as a hand-deployed pilot chute. Some military or emergency pilot chutes are ballistically deployed. A bridle is a piece of line or webbing that connects the canopy or deployment device to the pilot chute. Ripcords or equivalent devices for the main and reserve parachutes The ripcord is a device for securing the container closed prior to use. It usually consists of a handle, a flexible cable, one or more pins, and a device for securing the cable to the handle. Some ripcords use a stiffened cable instead of a pin. Similar to the ripcord is the main riser retain slash release cable slash handle assembly if the parachute is equipped with a main riser release system, such as the three ring release. Deployment devices for the main and reserve parachutes deployment devices are designed to provide an orderly and controlled deployment of the parachute during use. Typical devices include bags, sleeves, pockets, straps, divers, and sliders. Main parachute release mechanism and associated handles or static lines the main parachute release mechanism has two parts. One part is attached to the harness and the other to the risers. Typically such devices are the three ring release or capewell releases. These types may utilize a separate release handle to provide release of both sides with one motion. This cable slash handle assembly consists of a cable to each riser and a velcro mounted handle. The cables must be kept lubricated to function properly. There are several types of cable coatings used by various manufacturers. Nylon coating, which is hydroscopic, includes the yellow lowlin coated cables and the clear coated cables. This type of cable should be oiled frequently as climate conditions dictate. When you pull the cable between your fingers, if it squeaks like clean hair, then it needs to be lubricated. 
The red or new orange coated cable is pure FEP Teflon coating and requires no maintenance. Typically when the cable is removed from its housing, it is black oil in spots along the cable. This black oil is the residue of the cutting oil used in the manufacture of the housings. It is not harmful. In fact, if this black oil is distributed evenly along the cable, it provides limited lubrication. There is no need to worry about sand or dirt being attracted to the oil on the cable as it is more important for the cable to be lubricated than it is to be clean. Figure 2-3, the reserve may employ a static line, RSL, that is activated upon cutaway. This is covered in greater detail later in the chapter. Risers and associated steering toggles risers are part of the suspension system between the lines and the harness or load. Generally made of webbing, emergency parachutes usually have the risers integral to the harness. If they are detachable and not integral, and are being used for an emergency parachute, they require a cross connector, as they are tested with only one side connected. Main risers used on sport or military systems used for intentional jumping have release mechanisms installed. Steering toggles are usually designed specific to the riser for the type of canopy installed. Ram air canopies use the steering toggle to lock the deployment brake. Pulling on the toggle after opening releases the brake. Premature brake release is a major cause of malfunctions. Figure 2-4 Other harness-slash-container assembly components Other components designed to function as part of the harness-slash-container assembly, such as closing loops, also may be used. Closing loops used with automatic activation devices, AADs, on reserve or emergency parachutes are usually designed specific to ensure proper operation of the system. TSO standards The original TSO C23B for parachutes came into existence in 1949. The specifications were revised in 1984 to C23C and again in 1994 to C23D. The TSO is a simple two-page document that specifies the requirements for certification. This document also references a performance standard that the parachute must meet. C-23B parachutes were tested to standards under National Aircraft Standard Specifications NAS 804. When the TSO was revised in 1984, the specification document was drafted under the auspices of the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, S-17 Committee as Aerospace Standard AS-8015. When the TSO was revised again in 1994, the revised document became AS-8015B with the original as AS-8015A. Figure 2-5 is a table showing the pertinent points of each of the TSO certifications. For a more thorough study of the documents, refer to Appendix B. The TSO system consists of two parts. The first is the performance standards listed above. This ensures that the parachute performs as specified. The second is the production approval, which ensures that the manufacturer is able to produce the parachute as designed and tested. While minor design changes are allowed, any major design change must be submitted to the FAA for approval before implementation. A major change is anything that affects the airworthiness of the system of the parachute. For the aspiring rigger, the primary purpose of knowing the TSO system is determining the compatibility of components when assembling the parachute system. This is necessary in order to ensure that, besides fitting together properly, the performance standards are compatible. Under Advisory Circular, AC 105-2, Sport Parachute Jumping, the assembly or mating of separately approved components may be made by a certificated and appropriately rated parachute rigger or parachute loft in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions, and without further authorization by the manufacturer or the FAA. Under these guidelines, there are certain parameters that must be met. One of them is to ensure that the strength of the harness must always be equal to or greater than the maximum force generated by the canopy during the certification tests. Full knowledge of the TSO documents ensures that the above requirements are met. Canopy design accomplished design skills are not necessary for the rigor to properly service parachutes. The skills involved to become a designer can take several years of training and practice. It is necessary, however, that the rigor understands some of the basic concepts to relate the performance characteristics to the design theory of the components involved. For the average rigor, these concepts are accepted as those proven and tested in the finished product. The following are specific areas that the rigor should understand to determine the identity, function, and assembly of parachute components and their interaction. Understanding the sequence and method of deployment is necessary when assembling components to assure proper function. Most ram air parachutes are trimmed nose down, and as such the canopy tries to fly over its nose during deployment. This flight angle causes the top skin nose of the canopy to roll over the bottom skin leading edge closing off the cell preventing inflation. To counter this, the trailing edge of the canopy is deflected downward to apply brakes during inflation. This holds the nose up and open allowing air intake. 
These are called deployment brakes and are implemented by providing a brake eye in the steering line of the canopy located so as to apply the proper amount of brakes. The steering line is pulled down through the steering guide ring on the risers and locked with the nose of the steering toggle during the packing process. Loss of one or both brakes during opening will most likely cause a malfunction. Loss of one causes the canopy to turn into that side as the cells remain collapsed and the inflated side overflies the collapsed side. In-flight corrective action is to grab both toggles and apply both brakes evenly and quickly. Nomenclature all riggers should become familiar with Parachute Industry Association, PI, Technical Standard 100, TS 100, Standardized Nomenclature for Ram Air Inflated Gliding Parachutes, see Appendix I. This document is the official language and terminology used for Ram Air Parachutes. It specifies the parts of the parachute, the various construction methods, and the seam configurations used. This is necessary for the rigger to understand the manuals and repair procedures provided by the manufacturers for their products. Figure 2.6 identifies the components of a typical round emergency parachute. The nomenclature of this design has remained constant for several decades with a few exceptions. While some riggers who skydive think that the square parachute has replaced it, the round parachute still has many uses, and in certain instances, fulfills some mission requirements better than the square parachute. Pointer's Parachute Manual, Volume 1, Chapter 8, provides an excellent discussion of the design parameters and characteristics of round parachutes for those needing more technical background. Construction Concepts and Techniques TS-100 describes the various RAM air construction methods such as half-cell cord-wise, full-cell I-beam cord-wise, full-cell interlocking T-cord-wise, and span-wise configurations. When learning the various construction methods, the beginning rigger can become confused as to how the seams are folded together. Seeing the schematic diagrams of the various configurations can help in the repair sequence. Additionally, there are two basic methods of construction for the main seam used on modern ram airs. One method is to roll the adjacent bottom skins with the attendant rib together and double needle 301 stitch to hold the joint. Line attachment tabs are then applicated over the rolled seam for subsequent line attachment. The other method is the foil method where the rib has the line attachment tab attached directly to it and is flat stitched to the bottom skins allowing the bottom edge of the rib to be exposed. Round parachute construction is divided into two primary techniques, bias and block construction. Bias construction is most prevalent in the early parachutes and military designs. It is generally the stronger of the two techniques due to its ability to stretch more during opening. In bias construction, the fabric is cut and sewn so that the warp and filler threads are at 45 degrees to the center line of the gore. A typical example is the 28C9 canopy. Block construction is where the warp threads of the panels are parallel to the hem of the canopy. Block construction gained in popularity in the lightweight sport reserves of the 1970s and 1980s. They were easier to build and pack smaller. An example of this design is the Phantom slash Aerostar canopies, Manufactured by National Parachute Industries Incorporated. Additionally lines may run from link to link through the canopy or from skirt to link using reinforcement tape for the canopy portion of the radial seam. Operational theory The rigger must have knowledge of how the parachute functions. Without this, the rigger may not be able to assemble the correct components so that they function as a complete assembly. While the manufacturer may specify what components are to be used with their particular design, with the vast numbers of products on the market today, there are an infinite number of combinations being used by the skydiving community. While seeming to be compatible with each other, many designs have subtle differences that affect their performance and operation. Such differences include pilot chute drag capability and bag extraction force requirements. Pilot chutes should not be interchanged unless the drag capability and container extraction force is known. Materials The materials used in construction have changed over the last several years. This has resulted in better performance and durability. The use of incorrect materials can have a detrimental effect on the opening, flying, and landing characteristics of the parachute. The growth in popularity of the ram air canopies in the 1970s required new fabrics for the designs to function. Very low permeability fabric was necessary for the canopy to remain inflated and maintain the aerodynamic airfoil shape. To reduce the drag created by the suspension lines, newer lightweight and high-strength materials were used. First Dacron, followed by Kevlar, and now Spectra and Vectron. While reducing the line bulk and drag, these materials have introduced newer problems into the designs. The ultra-low permeability fabrics inflate faster and have almost zero stretch. As a result, the opening forces increase considerably. These effects have contributed to newer packing and deployment methods to reduce the loads on the parachutist and harness. These, in turn, affect the design of the container systems. Using this as an example, the rigger can see the chain of cause and effect in the design process. 
Complete coverage of materials is presented in Chapter 3 of this handbook. Damage damage patterns identified during the inspection of canopies can highlight problems caused from packing or incorrect use. By being able to identify these patterns, the rigger can provide the user with correct technique and, thereby, prevent possible injury or death. In addition, the rigger can provide valuable feedback to the manufacturer of potentially serious problems with new designs once they have been subjected to real-world conditions. While manufacturers conduct extensive testing programs before releasing new products to the market very often, subtle problems do not arise until the parachute has been in the field for an extended period of time. Containers The container component assembly of the parachute system is that part which encloses the canopies and lines, the deployment device, if used, and the pilot chute unless it is externally mounted as on a pop top. It is held closed by the use of cones or loops, which are secured by ripcord pins or locking pins such as are used on hand deploy systems. Containers may consist of single units as are used on pilot emergency systems or multiple units such as are used on skydiving piggyback systems. The term pack is used interchangeably with container. The harness and container assembly may be called the pack and harness. The term pack tray is used to refer to the bottom panel or section of the container where the lines may be stowed during packing. Early containers were simply a bag-shaped unit that the canopy was stuffed into and then tied closed. The parachute was static line deployed and the parachute is simply fell away from the balloon or aircraft allowing the canopy to deploy. With the advent of manually deployed free fall systems, the need for a more secure and tailored design became evident. Originally, the parachute systems were identified by the position at which they were located in relation to the body of the user. These were the back parachute, seat parachute, chest parachute, and lap parachute. The containers were usually rectangular in shape with four closing flaps. These configurations were primarily dictated by the need to fit the assembly into the fly deck of the aircraft. With the growth of skydiving, the container configurations and the associated terminology changed. The original location of the main parachute on the back and the reserve on the chest became known as the conventional configuration. Figure 27, the original tandem configuration with both. The main and reserve on the back became known as a piggyback, and the introduction of a two-person parachute system became the new tandem. Figure 28 and 2 to 9, Configuration When canopies were packed into early bag-type containers, they always wanted to assume a spherical or round shape. For the container to remain flat, it was necessary to tailor the fabric and then use frames or bow stiffeners to keep it flat and compress the pilot chute. Back designs utilized multiple cones and pins, usually three or four to maintain the length and width. Seat containers were usually more square and thicker since they were held in place by the seat pan. Most used two cones and pins for closing. The same was used for chest and lap parachutes. Many military systems still utilize these basic configurations today. With the introduction of skydiving in the 1960s, most equipment was of modified military designs, and the first generation of commercial products was simply colored versions of these designs. In the 1970s, skydiving canopies had progressed to ram air designs, which were smaller in volume and had different deployment requirements. Container designs evolved to meet these requirements. The introduction of the hand deploy pilot chute was probably the most influential concept in the evolving container design. Cones were replaced by fabric closing loops, and main rip cords and pins were replaced by hand deploy bridles and locking pins. It was no longer necessary to compress the spring loaded pilot chute inside the container. Through closing loops were used to compress the pack and make it thinner to conform to the body shape. The use of deployment bags and other devices helped provide shaping to the container. This was true for both square and round canopies. Today, most modern container designs have completely done away with frames and bow stiffeners. This has resulted in smaller, more flexible, more comfortable, and more efficient container designs. Instead of metal stiffeners, nylon plastic is used to reinforce the container flaps for backing the grommets. The nylon is lighter, easier to work with, and cheaper. Many of the modern military designs now follow the design concepts pioneered by the sport industry as they have proven better and more cost-effective. Figure 210 shows a modern military container. Modern design concepts the containers of today do more than simply enclose the canopy and deployment device. Sport containers in particular need to be designed so that they contribute to the deployment needs of the specific parachute. Piggyback designs have separate requirements for the main and reserve containers. The reserve container is generally small, tight, and mostly wedge-shaped. Virtually all popular sport systems are designed around the use of a ram air canopy. The deployment method of choice is a Type 5 deployment bag. In the early days of the ram air reserve, there were certain container design requirements specified by the manufacturers which are listed below. 
A hesitator loop configuration secures the bridle and holds the bag in until the reserve pilot chute is deployed and under drag. Figure 211 2. Non restrictive corners to allow the bag to be lifted off by the bridle in the event of a horseshoe type malfunction. Figure 212. These requirements were adhered to for many years. Today, containers achieve the required holding and deployment needs through design tailoring. The bottom corners of the reserve container are designed so that the bag is held in place while the pilot chute and bridle deploy and then releases the bag, rotating it out of the container top to bottom into the airstream. At the same time, the bag can still deploy quickly in the event of a horseshoe type malfunction. The main container is less restrictive than the reserve in holding the main canopy in place during deployment. This is important so that there is no tendency for the bag to twist or be unstable on deployment. With many of the main canopies used today, if the bag is unstable, it results in the main canopy opening unevenly and causing spins and possible malfunctions. Along with the main bag, the main risers must be able to deploy evenly for the same reasons. In the early days of skydiving, the primary body position was a stable, face-to-earth position. This resulted in the main container being behind the parachutist out of the airflow. One of the primary problems faced during those days was the high incidence of pilot chute hesitations. This was the result of poor training and lack of understanding of that airflow. Eventually skydivers learned to sit up during deployment causing the air to flow over their back sweeping the pilot chute into the mainstream. Hand-deployed pilot chutes were developed to make packing easier and eliminate the need for a metal ripcord. In the face-to-earth position, the primary purpose of the container is to hold the canopy and pilot chute closed, and then allow it to open during deployment. Today, Body positions experienced during free fall range from head down to feet to earth and everything in between. Where speeds formerly experienced ranged from 110 miles per hour, mile per hour, to maybe 140 miles per hour, today's speeds in a head down position can exceed 200 miles per hour. This has changed the container dynamics to ensure a more secure system and increased protection from the wind blast. These changes have resulted in more secure and streamlined configurations to accommodate these new requirements. Figure 213 shows a modern container design shape to meet the high-speed airflows of today. An additional area that needs to be addressed when designing piggyback systems is the main riser covers. In the early days of sport piggyback designs, the main risers were held in position by webbing keepers. As the sport progressed, the use of fully enclosed main riser covers became the norm. In their attempt to protect the main risers during high-speed free fall, some designs tend to restrict the deployment of the reserve container in the event of a total main pack malfunction. When this happens and the main container remains closed, the main riser covers do not open. Because of this, there is additional restriction over the upper corners of the reserve container. This contributes to higher reserve bag release forces. In severe cases, this can result in a reserve pilot chute in tow with potential serious consequences. The balance between sufficient main riser protection and the requirement for unhindered reserve deployment is a critical design feature. Most modern sport parachute containers have housings of some sort to accommodate rip cords and riser release cables. These flexible metal conduits come in three basic types in varying diameters, non-compressible, relaxed, and non-extendable. The housing type is critical to provide proper protection and function for the usage. Non-extendable is used for most ripcord housings, except on Navy seat packs. Relaxed refers to the ripcord housing that is not completely compressible. Non-compressible housing is the correct type to use for three-ring cutaway systems so the compression does not cause the sides to release unevenly. Harness design according to Pointer's parachute manual, the harness is an arrangement of cotton, linen nylon, or dacron webbing, which is designed to conform to the shape of the load, usually the body, to be carried in order to secure it properly so that the opening forces and the weight of the load are evenly distributed during opening and descent. The earliest harness was nothing more than a swing seat that the parachutist sat on and then held onto the risers or suspension straps. It soon became apparent that if the openings were in any way uneven, it could be very precarious for the parachutist. While the sling seat worked for the ride down, it was necessary to add additional straps to secure the parachutist. These straps included the leg, back, and chest straps. The standard harness configuration is equipped to secure a torso, head, arms, and legs with straps. Others have been added over time for additional purposes, such as survival kits or cushions. Figure 214 shows a basic military-style harness. This harness configuration has seven points of adjustment to allow fitting of most military personnel. Most of the early parachute systems had the harness detachable from the containers. This allowed interchangeability for various models. In the 1970s, skydiving systems began to integrate the harness into a true harness-slash-container assembly. 
This was accomplished by sandwiching the harness between the container and back pad and sewing them together. Figure 215 shows one of the earliest custom systems called the Super Swooper. This harness was the precursor of today's sport harnesses. As skydiving and sport parachute industry has grown, most of the equipment is now custom built for each individual. The standard piggyback harness configuration of today is a fixed main lift web with adjustments only at the chest and leg straps. Figure 216, elimination of the extra hardware and webbing has resulted in a dramatic reduction in weight of modern systems. Along with this has been an increase in comfort and flexibility. One of the most innovative designs adopted in recent years is the articulated harness. This design incorporates metal rings at the hip junction and the chest strap attachment. Figure 217, these rings allow a full range of motion both in the air and on the ground and increase the fit and comfort of the harness. Note however that hardware incorporated into the main lift web or junction of a harness should be equal in strength to the webbing or at least the certification of the harness. Type 7 harness webbing is 6,000 pounds tensile. Type 13 harness webbing is 7,000 pounds tensile. The stainless steel RW8 is certified to 3,500 pounds. The stainless steel 5,010 harness ring is certified to 5,000 pounds. The stepped harness is not as strong as the continuous horizontal harness, figure 218. If point loading occurs on a stepped harness, stitching may break, and the junction can fail with disastrous results. With a continuous horizontal, if all the stitching were to fail, the wearer would still be wrapped in webbing and restrained in the harness. In recent years and with the increasing popularity of vertical skydiving or free-flying, greater speeds are experienced with corresponding higher loads on the harnesses. For many years, harnesses were overbuilt as they were basically copies of military designs. As the sport has progressed, equipment has been made lighter and smaller. Bridles and deployment devices in the early days of parachutes, the lines and canopy were stowed in the container. During the deployment process, the canopy was extracted first, followed by the lines. This was known as a canopy first deployment. If the canopy inflated before tension was applied to the lines, a malfunction was highly likely and a hard opening shock a certainty. Over the years, it was learned that the deployment process needed to be controlled to prevent malfunctions. Hence the introduction of deployment devices that changed the deployment sequence to lines first by preventing canopy skirt from spreading until the lines were fully extended. At the start of the World War II with the advent of airborne paratroops, the main canopy was deployed from a direct bag static line system. In this system, the main canopy was packed in a bag that was permanently attached to the static line. After deployment, the bag and static line remained with the aircraft. This system is still used today with some modifications. For emergency parachutes, the military adopted the quarter bag in the 1950s for use with high-speed emergency systems. Figure 219, this was fairly complicated to pack but effective in controlling the parachute during opening. In the early 1960s, the sleeve was developed and soon became popular for sport parachuting or skydiving. With the growth of skydiving and in the increased use of the reserve parachute, it soon became obvious that the reserve parachute needed to be controlled more. In the mid-1970s, the two-stow diaper was developed for use with emergency and reserve parachutes. This design was soon followed by the three-stow diaper and the piglet-style diaper invented by Hank Escudo. During this time period, the deployment bag became the preferred method of deploying the increasingly popular ram air or square canopies. In 1977, Paraflight Incorporated introduced the first ram air reserve canopy, which utilized the free bag deployment system. This design continues to this day virtually unchanged as the preferred method of deploying square reserve canopies. Reefing devices slow down and stage the opening sequences of canopies, resulting in lower opening forces. This is particularly critical at higher speeds where the excessive G-forces experienced may injure or kill the user. The most common reefing device used today is the slider. Figure 220A and B, this device consists of a piece of fabric with grommets or rings at the corners through which the line groups pass. This restricts the inflation of the canopy and slows down the opening. While other methods have been developed for military or aerospace applications, the slider is the preferred method of reefing ram air canopies. Without this device, skydiving would not be as developed as it is today. Deployment types There are currently six different types of deployment methods, which are listed below. Type 1, canopy first deployment with this method, the lines are stowed vertically or horizontally in the container. Examples of this method are the T7A chest pack or the B12 back parachute. Figure 221, type 2, two stowed diaper or half diaper this method utilizes split line groups. Two stows from one line group lock the diaper, compensated by offsetting stows of the other line group in the container with the remainder of the line stowed in the container. 
Examples of this method are the early Strong 26 Low PO and the Pioneer K series reserves. Figure 222. Type 3, Escato or Piglet style flat diaper. This deployment features a full diaper with all lines stowed left to right or perpendicular to the radial seam. Examples of this method are the Piglet, Phantom, and Security Aero Conical SAC canopies. Figure 223, Type 4, Handberry or Preserve Full Diaper. This features a choker type diaper that wraps around the canopy skirt. It is locked with three stows and all lines are stowed on the diaper parallel to the radial seam. Examples of this method are the Preserve Series canopies, Strong Low Pole Light, and the Hobbit Square Reserve. Figure 224, the Military Quarter Bag is basically a version of the Type 4 method. Type 5, Free Bag with a Free Bag, the canopy is stowed in the bag, and lines are either stowed on or in the bag. They were originally used on the Safety Flyer Reserve. This is the dominant and preferred method for virtually all modern square reserves. Figure 225, Type 6, Sleeves The sleeve type includes a fabric tube that encloses the full length of the folded canopy. Lines are stowed on the sleeve. They were originally used on early sport canopies, particularly the Para Commander. Figure 226, a modern version, known as a slag, is used on some ram air canopies. An additional deployment method is the tail pocket. This is a fabric pocket sewn on the tail of a ram air canopy in which the lines are stowed. Figure 227. Securing the deployment device with all deployment methods, it is necessary to properly fold or stow the canopy and secure the deployment device with the lines. The early parachutes utilized hesitator loops to secure the lines. Figure 228. This method is still used today in many military systems. In modern designs that utilize types 1 through 4 and 6, the preferred method of locking the deployment device is rubber bands. The specification for standard rubber bands is MIL R1832. Type 1 are made of natural rubber and are half an inch times 2 inches. These were designed for use with the thicker Type 3 nylon lines such as on the 28C9 canopy. Many of the newer lightweight, round canopies use smaller diameter and fewer lines. Consequently, the standard rubber bands do not work well. Some manufacturers supply smaller, 1 and 1 quarter inch diameter rubber bands to be used with their canopies. It is extremely important to utilize the correct size rubber bands. With the introduction of the free bag system in 1977, Paraflight Incorporated used a Buna NO ring to secure the locking stows. Figure 229, during testing of the free bag system, they found inconsistent holding and breaking strengths of rubber bands. They wanted the locking stows to release at a consistent force to prevent bag lock. The O-rings provided this. A couple of years later, the O-rings were upgraded to a thicker diameter model. In 1983, Paraflight Incorporated replaced the O-rings with the safety stow. The safety stow is a continuous loop of elastic shock cord that runs through a webbing channel and through two grommets to secure the first two locking stows. Figure 230, in the event of any restriction on the locking stow, as the loop stretches, it allows first one side to release and then the opposite side. It is important to maintain the rubber bands or safety stow. Rubber bands are susceptible to heat degradation and then dry out. If they break prematurely during use, the parachute may malfunction. Non-mill. Specification rubber bands may react to natural brass grommets and may become gummy and sticky, causing the lines to stick to the diaper or bag. Rubber bands should be replaced during routine inspection and repack. Figure 231 A and B, the Buna NO rings should be replaced with the safety stow. The safety stow should be inspected for broken stitching or internal rubber strands. Figure 232, in response to occasional violent openings on ram air canopies, Parachute Labs, Jump Shack, in 2003 introduced the speed bag to eliminate line dump, line strip. The lines are retained in rubber bands 25% and from the edge of the bag. This balances the mass of the stows between the bites and center span of the stow. The bag has an additional flap on the top side that has slots for the rubber bands mounted on the bottom flap. These two flaps overlap closing the bag over the canopy. The design was used on main canopies only for the first three years. Its success led to the release as a reserve bag in 2006. Bridles The bridle is a cord or webbing strap that is used to connect the pilot chute to the canopy or deployment device. Main and reserve bridles, while sharing the same function, operate differently. Early bridles were simply a length of suspension line tied off to the two components. It was soon learned that the length of the bridle affected the function of the pilot chute and the opening characteristics of the canopy. On most round emergency and reserve parachute assemblies, the length and type of the bridle is fixed for optimum performance. The rigger cannot change the configuration of the bridle without approval of the manufacturer. There are two basic types of round canopy bridles. 
The first is a tubular nylon bridle that is tied on. The second is a pre-sewn bridle with loops at each end. The loop of one end is passed through the attach point on the pilot chute and then back through itself forming a lark's head knot. The other loop of the bridle is then similarly attached to the canopy apex. Figure 233, with this type, it is essential for the loop to remain loose to ensure the bridle is free-floating and self-centering around the apex lines. Hand-tack the loop to ensure this. Figure 234, square reserve bridles are generally built into the free bag. The bridle material is usually 2 feet wide or more for high drag. The original concept of the free bag is to allow the square reserve to deploy if the reserve pilot chute is captured resulting in a horseshoe type malfunction. The high drag bridle would then pull the reserve bag off the parachutist back and allow the canopy to deploy free from the bag. In the late 1980s, assister pockets were added to some bridles for additional drag as square reserves became bigger and heavier. Figure 235, early main bridles were simply longer versions of the reserve bridles. This was necessary to compensate for the burble created in free fall by the parachutist. In the mid-1970s, and with the advent of the hand-deploy pilot chute, the length of the bridle was critical in order to allow proper extraction of the locking pin that secured the pack closed. In recent years and with the almost total use of ram air parachutes, the need for collapsible main pilot chutes has become widespread. As the main canopies have become smaller and faster, the drag of the inflated main pilot chute after opening can have an adverse effect on canopy performance. This problem has been solved through the use of a collapsible pilot chute slash bridle system. There are two primary designs used to accomplish this. The first is the bungee collapsible configuration. This consists of a length of elastic shock cord inside a tape sheath on the bridle near the pilot chute end. Figure 236, when relaxed, it holds the apex of the pilot chute collapsed. When the pilot chute is deployed into the airstream, the airflow inflates the pilot chute, which deploys the canopy. After opening, the elastic pulls the apex down again and collapses the pilot chute, reducing the drag. While this system works, its main drawback is that certain air speeds are needed to inflate the pilot chute. Remember, the primary function of the pilot chute is to initiate deployment. Collapsing the pilot chute is secondary. The second type is the kill line collapsible configuration. This consists of a bridle with a full length channel through which passes a line of Kevlar or Spectra. Figure 237 the bridle is cocked and the lower end of the bridle is collapsed during packing. This allows the pilot chute to inflate immediately. During the deployment sequence, as the canopy inflates, the lower end is stretched to length and the centerline pulls the apex of the pilot chute down and collapses it. This configuration has become almost universal in use for skydiving today. The only drawback is if the user forgets to cock the bridle during packing. This results in a collapsed pilot chute and a pilot chute in tow. In the early days of use of the kill line bridle, this was a problem but has become less frequent today. Some bridles have a colored eye at the locking pin location to show if it is cocked and the center line is set correctly. Figure 238, the kill line configuration is used almost exclusively on tandem systems due to the high speeds involved and the size of the drogue pilot chutes. Some bridles are made from 2 inches. Kevlar tape and have tubular nylon center lines. Others are made from type 4 square weave with a spectra center line. The advantage of the latter is that it can be cut with a hook knife in the event of an on-person malfunction. Figure 239, another method of collapsing the pilot chute is to install a no. 8 grommet in the deployment bag and allow the bag to float on the bridle. After the canopy deploys, the bag slides up the bridle, inverts, and covers the pilot chute. This is commonly called the poor man's collapsible pilot chute system. The drawback to this design is the high wear on the bridle in pilot chute mesh. Pilot chutes A pilot chute is a small parachute that is used to deploy the main or reserve parachute. In the earliest uses of parachutes, the parachute was static line deployed. With the advent of manually operated or free fall parachutes, the need for a pilot chute was quickly recognized. There are two basic types of pilot chutes. The first is the spring loaded design. This uses a collapsible spring, which is compressed in the parachute container and held closed with the ripcord. When the ripcord is pulled, the pack opens and the pilot chute launches into the airstream. The pilot chute provides drag and pulls the canopy from the pack as the parachutist or load falls away. During this process, the pilot chute also provides tension on the lines of the deploying canopy and helps the opening sequence. Spring-loaded pilot chutes are used primarily for emergency and reserve parachutes. In addition, they are used in military free fall and training systems for the main parachute. The second type of pilot chute is the hand-deploy design. This type consists of the pilot chute canopy but does not have a spring to launch it. Instead, the parachutist extracts the folded pilot chute from a pouch or the container and launches it into the airstream. 
The pack is held closed by a locking pin attached to the bridle of the pilot chute. As the pilot chute inflates, it extracts the pin from the locking loop and pulls the parachute from the pack. The rest of the opening process is similar to the spring-loaded pilot chute. This configuration came into popularity in the mid-1970s and is now the primary method of deployment in skydiving. Spring-loaded pilot chutes Spring-loaded pilot chutes date from the 1920s. However, it was not until 1940 that the spiral vane pilot chute was invented. This design used a spiral spring that is easy to collapse and pack. The most common type of spiral vane pilot chute used today is the MA-1 model. Figure 240A and B, this is used in several military parachute assemblies. In the early days of skydiving, military pilot chutes, such as the MA-1 and others were popular. Soon commercial designs were introduced that improved on the MA-1 with better launch and drag characteristics. These included the grabber and hot dog pilot chutes. Both of these were primarily for use with main parachutes. With the advent of the hand-deploy pilot chute for the main, most of the improvement in spring-loaded pilot chute design has focused on its use in the reserve or emergency parachutes. This has paralleled the improvements in container design and the increased use of AADs. Both of these require better pilot chutes than in the past. One example for reserve use is the Magnum pilot chute designed by National Parachute Industries. Figure 241, with its unique shape, it provides maximum drag at low speeds, such as our experience during cutaways. Its design has been licensed by other manufacturers for use in their assemblies. Additional designs include the Vector 2 Reserve Pilot Chute and the Stealth Pilot Chute. The Vector 2 design is a balut configuration that eliminates the use of mesh. In the event of an unstable launch on its side, the mass of fabric is sufficient to lift the pilot chute and deploy the parachute. The Stealth Pilot Chute uses a conventional mesh design but has a unique spring-slash-cap configuration that allows the pilot chute to virtually disappear when packed, hence the name. The MA-1 spring with mesh in place of the veins, and a closed canopy instead of the scalloped canopy provides the best of both worlds, a spring that does not lock up on itself and high drag without the possibility of snag. Hand Deploy Pilot Chutes The Hand Deploy Pilot Chute was introduced in 1976. There are two types of hand deploy designs. One is the throw-out pilot chute, TOP, configuration. This is the type where the pilot chute pulls the locking pin located on the bridle. Figure 242, the original design had the pilot chute pouch. Mounted on the belly band. Today, the primary location is an elastic slash spandex pocket mounted on the bottom of the main container, BOC. Figure 243, most of the difficulties of this design have to do with pilot chute and toe due to misrouting of the bridle or failure of the pin to extract. The second type is the pull-out pilot chute, POP, configuration. This design has the pilot chute packed in the container, which is locked with a straight locking pin attached to a short lanyard and handle. Figure 244A and B, this handle is usually mounted on the bottom corner of the main container. The parachutist grasps the handle and pulls the locking pin from the locking loop and puts the pilot chute into the airstream. The handle is usually attached to the bottom of the pilot chute and as the chute enters the airstream, the jumper loosens his grip on the handle allowing it to be pulled from his or her hand. This makes for a positive deployment. The main drawback to this system is losing the handle due to it being dislodged while moving around in the aircraft or in the air. Fortunately, the handle does not go far and is easy to obtain because it is on a short lanyard that is tucked up under the side flap. Automatic activation devices, AADs, and reserve static lines, RSLs, safety considerations have led to the development of AADs and reserve static line, RSL, systems. These devices allow for automatic deployment of the main or reserve parachutes in the event of an emergency. Automatic activation devices AADs are devices that activate the parachute automatically. Modern systems combine a barometric sensor with a rate of descent sensor so that the system is fully automatic once turned on and calibrated. The activation may be by either pulling the ripcord pins or cutting the locking loops. Causing the pilot chute to release. Most older models use a mechanical or pyrotechnic pin pulling technique. Newer models use a pyrotechnic loop cutting design. For many years, AADs were primarily used by the military and student parachutists. The designs were bulky, expensive, and, to a degree, inconsistent. The installations themselves were cumbersome and awkward. In the early 1990s, a new generation of AADs became available. The Cybernetic Parachute Release System, Cyprus, uses modern parachute release technology. It is small, reliable, computer-based, and uses a pyrotechnic loop cutter. It has an auto-off feature that turns the unit off after 14 hours of operation to conserve power. It also has the ability to calibrate the unit for operation at altitudes other than the calibrating ground level.
Based on these concepts, other companies have developed similar systems and as a result, changed the approach to the design and use of AADs. Today, a good many sport parachutists use an AAD in some countries, rightly or wrongly, mandate their use by all parachutists. The following describes the operation and installation requirements of the Cypress Model AA. Other designs, such as the Vigil, are compatible with these installation requirements. Operation The Cypress system is a barometrically controlled microprocessor that activates a pyrotechnic cutter that cuts the container locking loop. When calibrated to ground level, the barometric sensor activates the unit firing the cutter when the descending parachutist reaches an altitude of approximately 750 feet above ground level, AGL, and exceeds a rate of descent of 115 feet per second, FPS. The Cypress consists of three parts, 1. Battery and Processing Unit 2. Control Unit 3. Cutter, Figure 245. The processing unit is generally located in a stowage pouch installed in the reserve container of the parachute system. Figure 246, the control unit is contained in a vinyl pocket located either under the pin protector flap or in the upper back pad area. Figure 247, the cutters may be located at the base of the pilot chute or on a flap over the pilot chute. Figure 248, each parachute system has its own particular requirements, and it is imperative that the rigger have the appropriate manuals for installation. Reserve Static Line, RSL, Systems A RSL system is a backup device for activating the reserve after a cutaway is performed. It usually consists of a line, webbing, or cable, which connects one or both main risers to the reserve handle, housing, or cable. The most common design used today has a ring through which the reserve ribcord cable is routed. The riser end attaches to a ring on the risers with a snap shackle for quick release capability. When the risers are jettisoned, the lanyard pulls the cable, releasing the ripcord pins, and activates the reserve. This results in a minimum loss of altitude during the cutaway procedure. The use of an RSL has saved many lives over the years due to low cutaways. Though originally developed in 1964, as the Stevens system, the RSL concept did not become popular until the advent of student piggyback systems and ram air canopies. Through the use of an RSL system, the student parachutist need only pull the canopy release handle in the event of a partial malfunction, and the main canopy is cut away and the reserve activates. In 1990, the PIA urged manufacturers to include RSLs as a standard feature on all harness-slash-container systems. Many did, and this resulted in an increase of RSL use for several years. Conventional, chest-mounted, parachute systems utilized a cross-connector at the junction of the riser to the lines of the canopy on each of the front and rear risers. This was so as to maintain drag if one side released before the other. The maximum amount of drag available is required to assure the reserve ripcord activation by the RSL and the release and separation of the offside riser. When applied to the piggyback, these cross connectors would hang up on the bottom of the reserve container preventing separation. Many manufacturers dismissed this need and elected to provide a reserve lanyard that was side sensitive, in that it would activate the reserve if the attached side released and the opposite side did not release. Others moved the lanyard to the base of the riser, which required only one cross connector. This location avoided the possibility of a hang-up on the bottom of the reserve and retained the drag integrity. In recent years and with the widespread acceptance of newer types of AADs, many parachutists feel that they no longer need an RSL. In reality, both systems complement each other. The AAD functions if the individual does not activate the main parachute. However, it is altitude and rate of descent, ROD, dependent. Below a certain altitude, if the rod is not met, the AAD will not function. Consequently, if a cutaway is performed below the activation altitude, it may take some time for the descending parachutist to reach the rod necessary to initiate activation, thereby necessitating rapid manual activation of the reserve. However, if an RSL is also installed, it would cause an immediate activation of the reserve as the main parachute disconnects and moves away from the parachutist. In the last few years, as canopy design has resulted in smaller and more sensitive canopies, many parachutists have elected not to use an RSL. The rationale is that in a violently spinning malfunction, which some of these highly loaded canopies are prone to do, it is preferable to cut away and regain stability prior to pulling the reserve. This reduces the chance of an entanglement with the deploying reserve. While this scenario has happened, it is a rare occurrence. Statistics show that many lives have been saved by using an RSL. RSL designs There are four primary design configurations of RSLs in use today and are listed below. One. A single side RSL where the lanyard is attached to only one main riser, usually the left side. Figure 249, only the one side is required to release to activate the system. This is the most common design in use today due to its simplicity. 
2. A dual side RSL where both main risers are connected with a cross connector which is the RSL lanyard. Figure 250A and B, both risers need to release for the system to activate. 3. The lore system developed by the French. This incorporates two lanyards, one from each riser, that are attached to individual curved pins that secure the reserve container with a dual locking loop. Figure 251, both risers must be released for the system to function. 4. The Collins lanyard slash skyhook system. This design utilizes a special lanyard that is attached to the bridle of the reserve free bag. Figure 252, cutting away results in the free bag being pulled directly out of the container by the main risers and results in very little altitude loss. Since the early 1990s, most, if not all, manufacturers have provided an RSL installation on their equipment either as standard or optional. If the rigger has a system without an RSL and the owner wishes to have one installed, the rigger should check with the manufacturer as to the availability of a retrofit kit or return it to the manufacturer for installation. Because the installation of an RSL is an alteration to the original design, the rigger needs approval either from the manufacturer or the FAA. Because of the nature of the RSL system, it is imperative that the rigger thoroughly understands the individual concepts. Unless he or she understands this and has the required manufacturer's instructions, the rigger should not attempt to assemble and pack a system with an RSL installation. The following describes the basic design and function of a single side RSL installation on a one pin reserve container. Main riser attachment The main risers must have an attachment location for the lanyard. In this example, a small ring is installed near the lower hardware end of the riser on the inboard side. Figure 253 is Desirable to locate the ring as close to the lower end as possible so that the pivot arc of the rise does not load the lanyard. This allows the riser end of the lanyard end to be as short as possible. If there is excess lanyard, it is difficult to stow, and it is possible for the lanyard to become snagged and unseated. It is important that the correct risers with attachment ring be installed. While many risers have a ring installation, not all are installed at the correct location. Consequently, the lanyard length will not match the factory dimensions. This can result in premature reserve activation when the main is deployed. Most RSL lanyard designs have a snap shackle or similar release device mounted at the riser end of the lanyard. Figure 254, this allows the user to disconnect the lanyard under certain circumstances. The most common one involves landing in high winds where the parachutist may wish to cut away the main canopy to prevent being dragged. If the lanyard were not released, the reserve would be deployed as the main is cut away. Ripcord cable routing The routing of the ripcord cable from the handle to the pin determines where the lanyard connects to the cable. Most RSL attachments connect with the ripcord cable either at the yoke area or just above the ripcord pin. Generally, there is a double ring installation where the cable end of the lanyard is located. Figure 255, on this particular installation, the connection is at the shoulder yoke area. RSL lanyard and container mount These two components are interactive. That is, the design of the container directly affects the design of the lanyard. Once the two above locations are determined, then the routing of the lanyard can be completed. It was originally thought that the lanyard should have a long length to allow acceleration during activation to pull the ripcord cable. This is not proven to be true and most manufacturers keep their lanyards as short as possible to prevent snagging and easier stowing. The racer cross connector slash lanyard is so sized as to not pull the reserve ripcord until both risers have separated in the past, a Velcro pathway was used for routing the lanyard. This was either on the shoulder yoke or the reserve riser. Experience has shown that the use of Velcro generally results in high wear and eventual damage to the webbing. Figure 256, on this design, the lanyard is stiffened with a short piece of coated cable and stowed in two pockets located on the yoke area. Figure 257, it is secure and has no wear points. The ripcord end of the lanyard is routed to the dual guide ring attachment location and the ripcord cable routed through the rings. Figure 258, the ripcord cable is then routed to the reserve closing loop. Figure 259 shows the RSL lanyard and ripcord cable at the moment of riser extension and just as the cable is loaded. A point that the rigger should be. Aware of is the pigtail configuration of the reserve ripcord that results from the use of the RSL. Figure 260, because of the sliding of the ring along the ripcord cable, a curling effect is imparted to the cable. This is a clear indication that the RSL lanyard activated the reserve. The rigger should carefully inspect the ripcord cable for any broken strands. If any are found, the ripcord should be replaced. If not, the cable can be straightened and returned to service. With the single side RSL, it is imperative that the main riser with the RSL attachment leave after the opposite riser. 
If the opposite riser stays connected while the RSL figure 260. Ripcord cable pigtail with broken strand. Deploys the reserve, there is the possibility of a main slash reserve entanglement. To ensure the correct staging of the cutaway, the release cable of the RSL side must be longer than the cable on the opposite riser. A minimum of 1 inch is the standard differential. Figure 261, if non-compressible housings are not used, the staged separation is not reliable. Joint efficiency Joint efficiency is the percentage of the measurement of strength when applied to the junction or fabrication of two or more materials. An example is the cross seam in a canopy gore where two panels of fabric are joined. The strength of the seam needs to be greater than the strength of the fabric. To achieve this, there are several factors that need to be considered in the design. These include the following. Fabric, the weight and weave of the fabric affects the type of junction used. Thread type, this is affected by the weight of the fabric. Generally, the lighter the fabric, the smaller the thread used. Accordingly, a smaller needle is used in order not to damage the weave of the fabric. Stitch type, this is determined by the type of seam needed for the design. For the French fell seam normally used in joining the panels of a canopy, the 301 straight stitch is used. Stitches per inch, this has a direct correlation to the size of the thread used and the stitch type. There is a fine balance between the security of the seam and overstitching. Too many stitches per inch dramatically affects the strength of the seam by perforating the material. The number of rows of stitching also affects this. While more rows generally increase the strength of the seam, too many perforate the material as well. Thread tension, as lighter fabric and thread are used, the thread tension balance becomes more important. Reinforcing, the addition of reinforcing through the use of tapes, cords, etc., adds to the strength of the seam. However, their use may also reduce the elasticity of the seam at the same time. Some of the previous factors also can affect heavier materials, such as tapes and webbings. In working with webbings in harness design, most construction methods have tended to overbuild the junctions. This has been done primarily because the materials have readily accepted heavier threads and stitch patterns. An area that needs to be addressed is that of restitching webbing. Until recently, there was not much study done to determine how much strength is lost in this process. G.S. Dunker, a parachute engineer, conducted a study that evaluated the variables introduced when restitching webbing junctions. Some of these variables included the following. The treatment or conditioning of the webbing. Condition our webbing has a resin treatment to make it stiffer as opposed to condition you or untreated webbing. The size and condition of the needle used in the sewing. Larger needles make larger holes. A blunt needle or one whose point is damaged, will do more damage to the webbing and weaken it. The size of the thread used. The stitch pattern used in length. A WW pattern is stronger than a box X pattern. The number of times the webbing is re-sewn. All of these affect the ultimate strength of the webbing junction or stitch pattern. Chapter Summary It is important to know the history of parachute design in order to move forward technologically. The old saying, those who don't know history are destined to repeat it, is especially applicable to parachute design and manufacture, where a relatively small, esoteric group of individuals who are loosely controlled and turn on a dime, churn out designs that some eager young test jumper is willing to try. This is not necessarily a bad thing. The civilian-led sport parachute market is responsible for just about all the newest innovations in the industry over the past 45 years. But it should be kept in mind that a new design generally takes about 10 years ringing out in the field to discover its failure modes and make it safe and reliable.